So, um, as an introductory assignment, I want them to be able to think, imagine you were founding a city, uh, where would you put it, uh, why would you put it there, what would you need, um, what would be here, hint, hint, water, <laughs> uh, what resources would you need, water, mm -hmm. um, food, food. take about 10 minutes just to like see what they can come up with and <clears throat> get into uh, uh, India. And then I want to examine um, India. Um, so we're talking about the Indus River Valley, so that's, um, that's over in this area. It's actually in modern day Pakistan, um, but it's still part technically of the Indian subcontinent. One of the reasons this area was settled uh, thousands and thousands of years ago was because of um, how fertile the land is, and that's uh, because of the monsoons. Uh, now monsoons are uh, the uh, wind patterns of the area that essentially um, play a big part in the environment and keep the soil, uh, keep the soil, soil uh, um, very fertile. Uh, so in the winter, these winds uh, come down northeast to southwest and um, basically help, um, well, dry out the region from the summer when the winds come uh, the opposite direction. And when these winds come from uh, the, um, uh, the the Arabian Sea here, or um, can't know, I got that right, the Arabian Sea, um, they bring with them. Uh, tremendous rainstorms, and um, it basically uh, just pours water on the region, which again makes the soil um, very, uh, very fertile. Like I said, that's one of the main reasons uh, the, this uh, continent was, this subcontinent rather, was settled uh, thousands of years ago, mainly uh, in the this river valley area. And I want the students to be able to uh, go through and talk about the different features, why they're important, and then link it back to um, the um, mm -hmm. civilization question. Mm -hmm. um, so and then I want to move into the Indus River Valley specifically. civilization to a non-civilization type social order, which is why we will try to avoid that. 
And yes, I am getting this good boyfriend spell, Patience Grasshopper. So what is a civilization? Well, diagnosing a civilization is a little like diagnosing an illness. If you have four or more of the following symptoms, you might be a civilization. Surplus production. Once one person can make enough food to feed several people, it becomes possible to build a city, another symptom of civilization. It also leads to the specialization of labor, which in turn leads to trade. Like, if everybody picks berries for a living, there's no reason to trade, because I have berries and you have berries. But if I pick berries for a living and you make hammers, suddenly we have cause to trade. Civilizations are also usually associated with social stratification, centralized government, shared values, generally in the form of religion, and writing. And at least in the early days, they were almost always associated with rivers. These days, you can just bisect a segment of land horizontally and vertically and boom, build a city. But 5,000 years ago, civilizations were almost always associated with rivers, whether that's the Tigris and the Euphrates, the Yellow River, the Nile, the Amazon Basin, the Coatzacoalco. God, I'm doing so good until I got to Coatzacoalco. Coatzacoalcus, maybe. Why river valleys? They're flat, they're well watered, and when they flood, they deposit nutrient rich silt. Well, I'm going to say about most of these civilizations later, but let's talk about this guy, the Indus Valley Civilization, because it's my all time favorite. The Indus Valley Civilization was located in the floodplain of the Indus and Sawardi rivers, and it was not the best place in the world to have an ancient civilization because the rivers flooded very reliably twice a year, which meant that it had the most available calories per acre of pretty much anywhere on the planet. We know the Indus Valley Civilization flourished a long time ago, probably around 3000 BCE. Why is that question literally hanging over my head? But people of the Indus Valley were trading with Mesopotamians as early as 3500 BCE. We also know that it was the largest of the ancient civilizations Archaeologists have discovered more than 1,500 sites. So what do we know about this civilization? Let's go to the bottom. Everything we know about the Indus Valley civilization comes from archaeology, because while they did use written language, we don't know how to read it, and no Rosetta Stone has thus far appeared to help us learn it. I meant the other Rosetta Stone thought bubble. Yeah, although come to think of it, either would be acceptable. So here's what we know. They had amazing cities. Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro are the best known, with dense, multi-story homes constructed out of uniformly sized bricks along perpendicular streets. I mean, this wasn't some ancient world version of Houston, more like Chicago. This means they must have had some form of government and zoning, but we don't know what gave this government its authority. Cities were oriented to catch the wind and provide a natural form of air conditioning. And they were clean. Most homes were connected to a centralized drainage system that used gravity to carry waste and water out of the city in big sewer ditches that ran under the main avenues, a plumbing system that would have been the envy of many 18th century European cities. Also, in the Dara, the largest public building was not a temple or a palace, but a public bath, which historians call the Great Bath. We don't know what the Great Bath was used for, but since later Indian culture placed a huge emphasis on ritual purity, which is the basis for the caste system, some historians have speculated that the bath might have been like a giant baptismal pool. Also, they traded. One of the coolest things that the Indus Valley civilization produced were seals used as identification markers on goods and clay tablets. These seals contain the writing that we still can't decipher and a number of fantastic designs many featuring animals and monsters. One of the most famous and frightening is of a man with what looks like water buffalo horns on his head, sitting cross-legged between a tiger and a bull. We don't know what's really going on here, but it's safe to say that this was a powerful dude because he seems to be able to control the tiger. How did these seals let us know that they traded? Well, because we found them in Mesopotamia, not the Indus Valley. Plus, archeologists have found stuff like bronze in the Indus Valley that is not native to the region. So what did they trade? Cotton cloth. Still such a fascinating export, incidentally, that it will be the subject of the 40th and final video in this very series. But here's the most amazing thing about the Indus Valley people. They were peaceful. Despite archaeologists finding 1,500 sites, they have found very little evidence of warfare and almost no weapons. Thanks, Thought Bubble. Okay, before we talk about the fascinating demise of the Indus Valley civilization, it's time for the open letter. Magic. I wonder what the secret compartment has for me today. Oh, fancy clothes. I guess the secret compartment didn't think I was dressed up enough for the occasion. An open letter to historians. Dear historians, the Great Bath? Really? The Great Bath? I'm trying to make history fascinating, and you give me a term that evokes scented candles, bath salts, and Frederick Pakai hair products? I know sometimes the crushingly boring names of history aren't your fault. You didn't name the Federalist Papers or the Austro-Hungarian Empire or Adam Smith. But when you do get a chance to name something, you go with the Great Bath, not the Epic Bath of Mohenjo-Daro, or the Bath that End All Baths, or the Pool that Ruled, or the Moist Mystery of Mohenjo-Daro, or the Wet Wonder, the Great Bath? 
really? You can do better. Best wishes, John Green. So what happened to these people? Well, here's what didn't happen to them. They didn't work into the current residents of that area of the world, Hindu, Indians, or Muslim Pakistanis. Those people probably came from the Caucasus. Instead, somehow around 1750 BCE, the Indus Valley civilization declined until it faded into obscurity. Why? Historians have three theories. One, conquest. Turns out to be a terrible military strategy not to have any weapons, and it's possible people from the Indus Valley were completely overrun by people from the Caucasus. Two, environmental disaster. It's possible they brought about their own end by destroying their environment. Three, earthquake. The most interesting theory is that a massive earthquake changed the course of the river so much that a lot of the tributaries dried up. Without adequate water supplies for irrigation, the cities couldn't sustain themselves, so people literally just picked up and left for greener pastures. Well, probably not pastures. It's unlikely they became nomads. They probably just moved to a different plane and continued their agricultural ways. I am already boring you, and I haven't even told you yet how to be a better boy and or girlfriend. I'm going to do that now. So we don't know why the Indus Valley civilization ended, but we also don't really know why it started. Why did these people build cities and dig swimming pools and make unnecessarily ornate seals? Were they motivated by hunger, fear, a desire for companionship, the need to be near their sacred spaces, or a general feeling that city life was just more awesome than foraging? Thinking about what motivated them to structure their life as they did helps us to think about how we structure our own lives. In short, you're clingy because you're motivated by fear and a need for companionship. And she finds it annoying because it's enough work having to be responsible for herself without having to also be responsible for you. Also, you're not really helping her by clinging, and from the Indus Valley in the Bronze Age to school life today, human life is all about collaboration. Trading cloth for bronze, building cities together, and collaborating to make sure that human lives are tilted to catch the wind. Next week, we will travel here to discuss the hot mess of But in the meantime, if you have any questions, leave them in comments, and our team of semi-trained, semi-professionals will do their best to answer them. Also, you'll find some suggested resources in the video info below, he said, pointing at his pants. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week. Today's episode was great. Of course, it's directed from world history, but anyway. Yes. <clears throat> so I want to... To... All right, so like you said, uh, um, well, like you said, the Aryans, the Aryans, um, basically came down from either uh, the Caucasus or Central Asia. It's likely that it was probably both, and then um, they were like one of the probably a conquering people. Um, there's evidence that they used. Uh, technology such as uh, chariots, which would have been very different uh, to a, a people group that really had no uh, system of uh, no system of defense, no weapons, things like that. Um, and if they were in fact peace loving, um, they would have been very hard to resist such an occupation. It's also interesting to note that it's probably likely that. Uh, they left the region uh, based on a, on a combination of all three of those things. Um, an earthquake is highly probable because, um, well, India is a subcontinent and the Himalayas were basically formed when um, the fault lines of Asia and uh, the subcontinent essentially smashed into each other. So um, it's easy to see how um, something like an earthquake would redirect tributaries like that or just simply climate change Climate change has been affecting the world for, um, well, since the beginning of the time, really. Since, yeah. Um, so it's easy to see how um, how the rivers may have uh, simply dried up or 